We will begin again and remake humanity without the corruption, greed, and hatred that the inner planets could not transcend. Fred grunted and shook his head. I don't see it. Anaros is charismatic, and he's smart. Watching his press release, he certainly thinks he's in charge, but he'd have to. The man's a first-rate narcissist and a sadist besides. He'd never knowingly share power with anyone if he could help it. The level of organization, of coordination, it seems beyond his reach. Fred gestured toward the screen. The light from it glowed in his eyes. Tiny images of Anaros giving his salute. It doesn't feel right. He's the kind of man who carries a lot of weight in a small circle. Playing at this scale isn't what he does best. He isn't a bad tactician, and the timing of the attacks was showy in a way that seems like he was likely behind them. And he's charming at the negotiation table, but he's not a first-class mind. And this is a first-class operation. I don't know how to put it better than that. Hey guys, Pete here. Those are words that the show's version of Fred Johnson will never speak to Holden. I'm still a little rocked from the last episode, but it's time to move on. Today I'm going to do a preview video of The Expanse Season 5, Episode 5, which is titled Down and Out. I'm going to look at where all the characters were at the end of Episode 4 and take a closer look at some of the details that we're probably supposed to be paying attention to. Quick spoiler warning, there will be tons of spoilers in this if you aren't caught up with The Expanse through Season 5, Episode 4. Four. I'm going to refer to the books, but I won't give away any future spoilers from them. That's your warning, and if you feel like you gotta go, please hit the subscribe button on your way out. Now let's jump in. Alex and Bobby served as our window into the Martian perspective in the last episode. They're in pursuit of Admiral Sovater and Emily Babbage in the ship, the Bar Keith. Beyond them being generally shady, and Emily asking Alex a lot of questions about the protomolecule and what happened when they arrived on Illus, we don't know much of what's going on with them. We do know they're traveling in three ships, and the only thing on their heading is a squadron from the Third Fleet. Alex doesn't want to believe that there could be a conspiracy this big. And Bobby points out that yes, three ships means that three crews either have to be in on it, or they're being paid to look the other way. She's convinced that they're going to stop and meet up with the Black Marketeer, and of course we never find out in Episode 4, because they get the alert about the asteroid and a nearly simultaneous attack on the Martian Parliament building. Building. As far as book five is concerned, this is all slightly different, so it's not 100% clear what's going on here. So to go off of just what we've seen on screen so far, we know through Ashford's story last season that there's likely some kind of connection with some Martian military and the Free Navy. At the same time, Bobby has uncovered a lot of people making money selling weapons to them, so we can't say for sure how big the conspiracy is. The Martian side of things is the least developed as far as what we saw go down, so I'm very interested to see where they take this. On Earth, Amos and Clarissa, who I'm going to refer to as Peaches from now on, are underground in the pit. They're near where the second rock dropped, and we saw that even way underground, they saw some effects from the impact as the ceiling had a giant crack. So we can expect damage on a scale from total chaos on the low end to complete destruction on the surface above them on the other end. There's a lot of questions about how bad these asteroid impacts were, how much damage they're going to do. Based on what we've seen, we don't really know the answers to that yet. I imagine that we're going to learn a lot about that firsthand through Peach's and Amos's perspective. Because it is safe to say that they are going to have to try to escape the prison and that things are going to be drastically different on the surface when they get there. A question you might have had about this matchup is, why is he going to see her? After all, she tried to kill Holden. She put a bomb on the Sung Yoon, and then she sent out the fake message from Holden, which went a long way to get things started around the slow zone, and a lot of people died. And after that, remember, Amos was all about just killing her right there. Anna and Naomi convince him not to, and then she does actually help save the day when she deactivates the Behemoth's comm laser, and that's somewhat redeeming, but it doesn't undo what she did or explain why Amos is interested in seeing her when he goes to Earth. In my episode 4 breakdown, I said that it looked like he was figuring out that he wanted to help Clarissa in real time. Like she asked him the question and he isn't sure about the answer until he thinks about it. It's like he's compelled to go see her, but he doesn't know why. And we can't imagine that a lot happened off screen when they were coming back from the slow zone over the couple of months that she was a prisoner on the Rossi. But in the books, at least, we never really learn any more about that. 
So that idea that he doesn't know why, Wes Chatham actually confirmed this in the after show that they do on the Amazon channel. And it emphasizes why these two work together even though they don't necessarily make sense. As mentioned, he said he was compelled to go there. He didn't really know why. And he figured it out while they were there that he wanted to help her. Because even though they come from very different backgrounds, about as different as you can imagine, he wanted to give Peaches that same thing that Lydia gave him. And one of the things that's really missing from a book reader's perspective here is that we don't hear Amos's internal dialogue. And while that doesn't really explain any of this, it does help to explain how he got there without having a solid plan of what he wanted to do or really an understanding of what he might be able to offer her. As fate would have it, the rock drops and the situation changes immediately. We saw him struggle through this personal interaction because he doesn't really know how to act like that. He doesn't really know how to interact with people in that way. Now they're in a purely survival situation. They're stuck underground with all these really bad people that all have body modifications that make them superhuman more or less. And the world outside is falling apart. And I don't know about you, but if I was in Peach's situation, I don't think there's a better person you could hope to be with than Amos, especially when he's on your side. Elsewhere, Nancy Gao's decision to stay on the planet, that brought about her demise, and that means that the UN has no leader at the moment. Later in the episode, we learn that with all the chaos that's going on, the line of succession is unclear. I think it's a good guess that Abbasarala will have some part to play in that. Obviously, she uncovered the plot. She knew what was going on. Fortunately, she was on Luna, so she's safe. And in her last sequence, we saw that they were able to retask the Watchtower satellites, and that should help to protect Earth from any future asteroids. A big question mark in Abbasarala's story is also her husband and her family. She's not able to reach them. She doesn't know what's going on. And we'll have to wait and see how bad things are on Earth before we know how much danger they're in. On Tycho, we did see Fred Johnson's death. I'm kind of bummed about it. I was really enjoying him withholding this season. And he was shot in the books when they stole the proto molecule, but he survived. And there were some aspects of his story that come after that I will miss, but I kind of feel like they wouldn't have changed this if they didn't have a good story reason to do it. What do we miss with Fred being gone? Well, like that quote that I opened the video with, he is able to give Holden insight into who Marco is. He doesn't know him well, but he does know of him. And he certainly could slip in a different belter to do that part or even use Monica because, you know, she seems to have been talking to people inside his organization. What's really missing when you lose Fred is he was the opposite side of the coin from Marco. With the ring gates being open, life in the belt is going to change. We'll talk about Marco in a second, but his idea is that he wants to take control of the belt with force, while Fred was trying to make alliances, build his own navy, but ultimately work with the inners instead of fighting against them. But he is gone and there's nothing changing that, and his protomolecule sample is also no longer secure. All of that adds up to it not being very hard to figure out where Holden's mind's going. He has the healthiest of all fears of the protomolecule and certainly won't want to see that end up in the wrong hands. But his life partner is also with Marco Inaro. It's curious that they wanted Monica for some reason. This could be as simple as they just wanted her for what she does. She's a reporter, a journalist, so they could have used her as a mouthpiece. But I imagine that we can expect that she'll stick next to Holden, at least for the foreseeable future. And as I said, it's not a stretch to think that he's going to want to go after the protomolecule and go looking for Naomi. And they do have Sakai as a prisoner, who was working closely with the Free Navy, and she may turn out to be an asset. We also have Kamina Drummer. She wasn't in the episode, so there isn't much that we can say. She was planning on hunting Marco. She said that she wanted to collect the bounty. It would help provide for her family, give them some security. Plus, she hates him because he killed Ashford. Now he's killed Fred Johnson. So it'll be interesting to see how she reacts, what her crew thinks about the new situation. If you go back and watch the season five trailer, there's quite a few shots of her with the Free Navy. Her family's there. It's not clear what's going on and I can't wait to find out what her plan is if that is a plan or what's going on there. Marco Inaros and the Free Navy is the last thing we need to talk about. 
What's he want? What's he doing? He just committed a massive atrocity. He said it was in retaliation for generations of atrocities that the inners have committed against the belt. He's not necessarily wrong about that. And those real grievances are shared by a percentage of the population, but these methods will be far too extreme for a lot of belters. They may not like Earth, they may not like Earth's government, and the things that the inner planets and their corporations have done, but they wouldn't accept this level of incredible violence. So what does he want? He wants power, obviously. You don't need to know that much more about him if you just pay close attention to his scenes on the Pella. The way he interacts with Naomi and with his son, you can see that he's a manipulator. In the excerpt I read, Fred describes him as a narcissist, and that seems fair. And he saw an opportunity in all the uncertainty that's hanging over the belt to commit this act of terrorism and try to consolidate power. And in his twisted logic, he'll have this navy, they'll regulate all of the colonization going through the ring gates to the new planets, and in that they can preserve this way of life for people who live in the belt, who are going to lose whenever their resource extraction is no longer important, and they can't go and live on these new worlds either. So there's some demagoguery going on. If he can take control, he doesn't really have to win popular support from all of the belters. He can appeal to their desires. He can appeal to their fears. And if the Free Navy can control the ring gates, take power away from the inner planets by taking away their ability to control that, then everyone would have to go through him. And if he pulls it off, it is an impressive feat, since no one would ever be able to have done something like that in the past. One thing that he seems to have that no other belters ever had had is access to Martian technology. Due to the political situation on Mars, he was able to get a hold of the stealth composites that made the rocks possible, and he's also flying around in a pretty impressive Martian warship. If you go to the X-ray feature on Amazon Prime, you can see some illustrations of the Pella, his ship, and it's pretty friggin' impressive. When Naomi asks about it, he says it's one of many, and I'm interested to see what he does actually have here, because it would be difficult for anyone from the belt to be able to go up against this. And taking Fred Johnson out makes it less likely that anyone is going to be able to organize a resistance. Naomi is currently his prisoner. We saw her locked in her room at the end of episode 4. She initially came there to try to save her son. She's likely starting to understand that he's a little too far gone. He's sort of in the brainwash category at this point. And so she's just going to have to figure out how she can do something to undermine them where she's at. Or she's going to have to try to escape. And man, there's so much more that we could talk about, but I think that's a good place to leave things off. Let's do the rest in the comments. Let me know what you're thinking. If you want to talk book spoilers, that's cool, but make sure you mark them so other people don't get spoiled. I think I'll be doing a full book discussion video after episode 5 and after episode 10, because there's a lot of stuff I've had to leave out of these videos and it's kind of killing me. So let me know what you think. Let me know what you want to see. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.